Thank you, and thank you, everybody. I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you a little bit about the things that the European Technology Platform Zero Emissions has, has been doing, and particularly want to focus a little bit on looking out to 2050, because we thought it would be interesting to do, I know everybody does modeling, and every model, of course, is wrong, but we tried to do some modeling to look to see what 2050 might look like. The, the technology platform Zero Emissions is a multi-industry, multi-stakeholder, including NGOs grouping across Europe. It's been in existence since 2005, and um, we, we aim to help the European Commission and help industry and help other governments in understanding the way the, way the energy system may go in the future, particularly with these emissions uh, targets in, in mind. So, I want to talk a little bit about the modeling we've done. It's the whole energy system. Our previous models focused on electricity, and I think that's something maybe we were slow catching on to this, but looking at electricity is a, it gives you a different answer from if you look including heat, transport, and energy-intensive industries. We heard earlier the importance of energy-intensive industries and their role and the importance of what they need for the future, but also when you integrate heat, particularly with electricity and transport, you get a different potential optimum. And I want to propose to you a business case for action in, in the field, in this case of, of CCS, because people often talk about CCS as being expensive, but our modeling suggests that addressing climate change is a cost to society, but you need to use all the tools available to you, including CCS, if you want to get the lowest solution, lowest cost solution. Okay, I borrowed this chart, thank you very much. I think it's a chart that we we, we, we all know. I particularly like the bottom graph because, you know, that is the magnitude of the challenge that we apparently are taking on. This morning we've seen graphs that show the starting from a point and going down, but the reality is our CO2 emissions are going up, and the idea is to reverse that trend. And I, I like to remind myself that this is a very big challenge we face here, and we're not going to get a one-size-fits-all solution. We need a regional solution, we need a local solution, we need a solution that fits each individual case around the world, whether it is Norway, uh, the Netherlands, or, or India. So this is our energy system model that we've, we've created. Um, it has um, energy sources around the outside, it has energy uses in the middle, and it has conversion processes. Those conversion processes include things like pumped hydro, they include things like battery storage, they include things like uh, converting methane to hydrogen, and they include things like electrolysis. And we put in a cost curve for these technologies from 2010 out to 2050. We took very aggressive cost assumptions in terms of cost reduction for each of the technologies in general. We tried to go for the most um, positive assumption about cost reduction of the technologies, because I think as mentioned this morning today already, technologies such as solar have in fact reduced their costs faster than people expected. So it seemed a good idea to do the same thing for things like batteries. And we have a model that integrates it together. I'd like to thank NTNU, Sintef, and the whole team who've contributed to this model, which in fact is strongly based upon the work of NTNU and some people who are present here in the, in the room, and data we collected across Europe for the energy system of Europe as a database uh, and as a technology and cost base. The model is, in fact, a very simple model. I don't want to make it sound too complicated. And it's based on countries, country by country. Why country by country? Because the countries of Europe have to make proposals to the European Commission to contribute to the NDCs. And we tried to produce a model that would say, what could each of the, the countries we looked at do and contribute to their proposals within Europe? Uh, as I mentioned, it includes heat, energy-intensive industries, transport, and power as an integrated system. So it has an investment optimizer on the left and it has a dispatch optimizer on the right. And this is something we've been talking about at lunch, I think is really important. Are the existing market structures that we have, whether it's the ETS or the merit order based dispatch system, in fact the right structures for incentivizing investment in low CO2 emitting technologies. But this model just assumes existing type infrastructures and assumes they work perfectly. We're looking out to 2050, and on the right, I want to emphasize that we have in here um, weather data, because this model tries to dispatch for every hour of the year the 
the energy demand, whether it's heat or electricity or, 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 or the other uses of energy, and it relates that to previous years of historical weather data region by region of Europe, which we gathered from the various people who published this information, and we assume the weather in the future will be not so different from the past in terms of where the sun shines and when around, around Europe. And as I mentioned, we look at costs and we look at efficiency. Okay, so we looked at these 10 countries in particular. We chose those because we thought they were particularly interesting for the study, and of course, it's a lot of work to collect the data. Of course, Norway is at the top. As I should have said, I'm delighted to be here in Trondheim today to present this. Um, we saw earlier this, uh, the European Economic uh, Projection Plan, and what we, we showed here is I tried to baseline what we're talking about. We're working from 2010, not 1990, so when we talk about an 80% reduction in um, CO2 emissions uh, or 95% reduction of CO2 emissions. This, of course, is from 2010, which is a more challenging target. We've gone to the point of 95% reduction in CO2 emissions in 2050, and uh, I want to show you what we think are the things we have to do to get to that point. This is electricity generation in the 10 countries. I looked at each of the energies, but I want to show you this chart. What you see here is the generation in, in terawatt hours per year over that period of time between 2010 and 2050. And you might say, well, these graphs don't look so different. And indeed, they don't look dramatically different. We've tried to incorporate government policies, like on nuclear, we've incorporated government policies on things like the phasing out of unabated coal. And we've also endeavored to include um, uh, the, the, the other changes that we see happen in the market, but we haven't incorporated taxation, we haven't incorporated uh, incentives such as feed-in tariffs. So the growth of wind and solar and, and, and hydro that you see here is we're saying is on, a, is on the, the least cost, best solution. So we're saying it makes sense to have a rapid growth of each of these technologies. You'll see on the left-hand graph some sort of cross-hatched areas. Those are the parts of the mix which include CCS, and we see that as important to take CO2 out of the system from the backup power that you need to integrate the renewables. And you see a growth in demand for electricity. Some regions of Europe think that electricity demand should go down. We decided that we would assume that electricity demand stayed flat, and we would assume population stayed flat, and we would assume standard living stayed flat, so that, in a sense, you can multiply these results by any assumptions you want to make about energy efficiency or growth or population growth, to keep it simple. This is generated heat in the 10 countries. And what you see here is that heat is, in fact, one of the most important, the most important CO2 emitter. And therefore, we often forget heat as an important issue. Of course, the exception is Norway. Of course, here in Norway, the electricity and the heat is almost entirely derived from, from renewable hydro, which, of course, is fantastic. Um, the model basically replaces simple gas, oil, and coal heating by district heating and CHP. The model says district heating is a no-brainer. It saves you money and it saves you CO2 emissions. Isn't it interesting? It isn't more widely used across Europe. Uh, centralized heat facilitates centralized CO2 capture, and that obviously allows you to effectively eliminate CO2 emissions from what is, at the moment, a highly distributed sector of the energy system. And without CCS, simple fuel heaters continue in the system. It's a small amount, but it does continue. Okay, transport. Our model for transport, uh, this was a, a strong debate within the ZEP community. Um, it, transport generally now creates distributed emissions, so again, it's difficult to deal with. Switching to electricity and hydrogen can centralize those emission sources and again, facilitate CO2 capture if we choose to do that. Uh, only road transport's been considered. We haven't considered air and we haven't considered rail and we assumed a 75% conversion limit. In both cases, the graphs look the same. The model reaches the 75% limit by 2050 with a mixture of hydrogen and battery vehicles. Interestingly, the early adopters are Norway and Switzerland, and that, of course, I think is interesting because we didn't tell the model to come up with that answer, but you'll see that not only are Teslas a plaything of the rich in Norway, it's a plaything of the rich in Switzerland in just the same way. And the model can predict that, which is kind of, kind of interesting. So this is the cost-benefit analysis for, for these 10 countries. And you have across the bottom, you have CO2 emissions in millions of tons per year. 
and you have on the left, you have 2010 as it was, and then to the right, you have zero. And you see the blue shaded line, that is kind of the European Union's target, so this is where we want to get to. And um, we see what this suggests, and you will see that um, without CCS, you have a red bottom line, which I thought was rather a nice analogous to this morning. Um, the fuel savings and efficiency improvements um, and the technology cost curves we put in mean that the curves are quite flat. So this model is not saying it's very expensive for Europe to achieve its emissions uh, reductions targets if the technology moves forward at the rate that we expect, whether it's solar cost or, or battery cost or whatever. There's no inflation in here, so this is all 2,010 euros. So again, you can take that out of your uh, analysis when you're looking at the graph. As I said earlier, district heating and CHP give cost reductions in the early years because it adopts a kind of a Polish model of implementing district heating wherever that's realistic. Um, to get to 95% emissions can only be achieved with CCS, as you can see from the graph. Makes logical sense. If you have to back up your wind and solar, you better make sure you're not emitting CO2 from your backup plant. Makes sense, doesn't it? Without CCS, the emissions in 2050 will be three to four times higher. I'm not talking percent, I'm talking three to four times higher than it would be if you did do that. And the saving in 2050, and remember, it's only a model, and there's a lot of assumptions, but it calculates cumulatively more than one trillion euros of savings for Europe. If Europe wants to achieve the targets, it needs to have the whole range of technologies in the mixture that it puts in place. And it's not just to 2050, beyond 2050, it shows 50 billion a year saving for these 10 countries. And we would argue that it's really important that we get this process moving quickly, and we're particularly focusing on hubs and clusters to put in place something at Rotterdam, put in place the excellent projects planned in, in here in Norway to get this process facilitated. If we look at per capita emissions of CO2 for the 10 countries, we see that most of the countries can according to the model, achieve the less than one ton per capita per year that many people talk about. Um, we made a conservative assumptions in here for the oil and gas industry, and particularly the offshore part, and it's interesting because this actually shows that Norway has quite a big challenge in spite of its fantastic starting point with electricity and, 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 and heat, because the population is small and because the CO2 emissions from providing oil and gas to much of Europe and much of the world means that there's, there's a big opportunity for, for a big challenge for Norway going forward there. We then did a CO2 balance chart for the 10, for the 10 graphs and what, the 10 countries. What you see is the brown is the non-industrial emissions and the blue is the industrial emissions. And this model pretty well eliminates CO2 emissions from non-industrial sources. Um, in, 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 in the years to 2050. You see the grey hatched area, that's the CO2 captured by the CCS part of the mixture, and the green is the CO2 absorbed from the, the, the regrowth of renewable biomass. Um, CCS with sustainable biomass is a big part of this model. The model likes biomass. It considers biomass as a fuel as important for integrating wind and solar. It's a big part of the mixture, both for electricity and for, and for heat. Then in terms of storage volumes by country, so we tried to assess how much CO2 needs to be stored between 2010 and 2050 for each of the countries of Europe, and we compared that with recent European Union projects looking at available storage volumes. And only Germany would need to export CO2 in order to meet its uh, capture volume that I'm showing here. The other countries uh, at least believe they have enough storage capacity in the projects that they've evaluated. So then we looked at the total energy system utilization. And this is energy used. This is not primary energy consumption. It's the energy as it's used, so mechanical power at the wheels of the car or whatever it might be. And what we see here is, again, the graphs don't look so different. But there's a strong reduction in the use of an oil and gas for heating and transport. And, and I'm my colleagues in the oil and gas industry don't seem to be too concerned to see such a graph, partly for the reasons that were explained earlier, that the world market for growth is perhaps pretty big. But this shows that Europe will actually spend less money on oil and gas for, for heating and transport. And gas is switching from being a heating fuel substantially in Europe, not in Norway, but substantially a heating fuel to be used for making electricity for backup and for CHP with CCS to drive heat pumps. So the heat pumps of Europe, which will be the heating system of the future, 
will be using stat oils gas rather than uh, used in, in, in simple boilers. Continued use of local fuels with CCS will be used to integrate wind and solar. Strong growth of sustainable biomass, similar volumes in the two scenarios, and hydro wind biomass and ambient heat, because ambient heat is a massive renewable energy source, um, are important in achieving the European Union's renewables targets. And the model predicts achieving those targets, you know, the 27% or the 30% or whatever it might be uh, in, in both cases. Now, we talked about the importance of a regional focus, and perhaps I don't need to say it again, but the model says you'll get a different solution in Poland where they have indigenous coal. Why not have the people of Poland, the miners of Poland, use coal as long as they don't emit the CO2? It's good for energy security. It's good for a number of social benefits we talked about earlier. But there will be different solutions in different places. We looked at the hydrogen economy. We found in some regions of Europe, the model selects hydrogen. In other parts of, of Europe, it doesn't. But that's interesting, and why not? What's the problem with that? And we think it's important we put in place these, these hubs to facilitate the, de the deployment of, of CCS. The sites are fairly well known, Norway, Netherlands, maybe UK. These are the places where it makes most sense to move fast and first in, in, in Europe. And clearly, we should be using the regional funds, the development funds of Europe that are available, the Junkers funds, to, to make this happen. We need to look at the whole value chain, but we mustn't be stuck with a single value chain. The NER 300 projects demonstrated it's quite difficult to handle the counterparty risk between all the participants in a whole value chain. It's probably as important for um, European Union and member state intervention to break up the value chain, to facilitate these hubs and clusters so that the next cement plant that wants to connect to a CCS hub doesn't have to think about the whole value chain but can hook up to something that's already existing and proven. So in conclusions, the the 2050 reduction targets can only be achieved with CCS, according to our simple model. Without CCS, the emissions would be three to four times higher. The value of CCS is one trillion euros up to 2050 and 50 billion per year afterwards. So this is a lot of money we're talking about here, and that, that value stream can drive a business case for investment now. The future of energy intensive industries relies on CCS, as we heard this morning. And we need infrastructure investments to get these reductions in place by 2030. And I believe there is a business case now for this to happen. And CCS facilitates the renewables targets. You get higher capacity factors if you have CCS in the mix. And biomass with CCS are key to the 1.5 degree targets that we've talked about this morning. So that's what I wanted to, sh to, to share with you. And I look forward to our discussion with the panel in a few minutes.